I started following an old program that I had from John Meadows. So it's a real pure bodybuilding. Brutal program. high volume. <laughs> high volume. I feel like I've got sunburn <laughs> every day. Yeah. And, um, and again, it's, it's a lot of challenge sets like we spoke about. It's one of the reasons that I started doing this with my clients as well. Like you mentioned it. And then, and then in the program, the first week I had fucking challenge sets on my leg extension. You know what I mean? Blood flow restriction challenge sets. As many reps as I could for fuck's sake. So Steve, welcome back to the show. We've spoken in our first couple of episodes about how to build a training program, but now we've got people getting that in place and maybe getting started in the training. I think it'd be good to just talk progression because I think this is something where people kind of assume some things are progression or expect this to be, or don't even know how to progress their workouts. You just end up in the same workout over and over and over again and not getting anywhere. So in your mind, what are the key things you're looking for for to get let's start with the workout itself what do you determine as a successful workout for a client how do you know that workout's been good well there obviously when you do a workout and you have a goal to work towards there are specific acute variables that we're trying to track monitor and progress on right such as you know everyone knows you know, three sets of 10, all right, let's make sure we get those three sets of 10 in. And if we're not, then we need to tweak something, whether that's the load or the speed of movement, which is another variable that we call tempo um, or manipulate the rest period. You know, there's all these variables that we can manipulate to um, control our training progression so that we improve. So I think that's the simplest way to answer that question. Mm. I always look at, I remember reading Mike Isotel's um, mm. book on hypertrophy. And they talk about, they break it down into acute overload and progressive overload. And I, th- I like that way of looking at it because a lot of people, progressive overload is a buzzword in the industry at the moment where everyone is talking about, okay, we've got to make sure progressive overload, progressive overload. And you watch these people train and they train like shit. And I'm like, acute overload is missed, right? Before we talk how to progress this stimulus, is the stimulus you're actually getting sufficient in that workout? If the workout itself is crap, I don't give a toss how we progress that workout. And when I look at one of the things that you're saying there, like the research at the moment, is that mechanical tension is the biggest drive of hypertrophy, more than the other, more than you know, metabolic stress, more than muscle damage. And a lot of the stuff that's coming out at the moment is you have to be like one to five reps. If your goal is to build tissue, one to five reps away from failure. Now, whether that's a you know a 50 rep set or whether that's a six rep set, anywhere between those two things is good enough. But obviously, if you're doing 50 rep sets, it's going to be a four-hour workout. And if you're doing less than five, it's probably going to bang your nervous system and your joints up. So the our aim, I think, if I presume most people are looking at this, and we'll talk strength later, I probably want to build muscle. We need to ensure that we safely get people to that one to five reps in reserve. So when you're getting your clients who want to build tissue, how are you doing that? How do you ensure they get to that point safely? Well, um, we, you know, the simple way of using, doing it is using um, a specific percentage, obviously, of what you might deem to be their one rep max as an estimation. Um, you don't have to test it, obviously. Um, you can gauge that off different things. And then um, give them an RPE, like a rate of perceived exertion. So how hard are they working in that set? what do they perceive their level of intensity as? Well, that, but, but there's a problem with that is that it's subjective, right? So um, as we've spoken about before, beginners aren't aware of what hard work is. And actually, one of the best things that I've been doing in the last few months since you told me that you're doing this with your clients is using a set to failure. And it's worked wonders for my beginner clients and intermediate clients. All right, a set to failure sounds crazy, but for beginners, they can do it. It teaches them how to grind, work hard, gives them, uh, you know, mental fortitude. But it teaches the client something because I'm giving people three sets of 10 on a dumbbell press, right? And then I give them the fourth set. All right, now we're going to go max effort. And they're getting 15, 20, 25 reps out from what was eight to 10 and struggle. So it teaches them, all right, well, that's what hard work was. And now you're pushing to a max effort. And now I'm aware as a coach of what you can really push to. 
And now you're understanding what an RPE scale actually is. So thanks for <laughs> telling me no, about that. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I think you know using, I mean? things, using things like that, like challenge sets, I think are so valuable because that again, sense, like yeah. progressive overload is a buzzword in the industry at the moment. So is reps and reserve, right? It's the big Mike Isadel yeah. thing. We, we have to go to like one to three reps and reserve. And you're right. And I agree. But if you don't know what naught reps and reserve is, how do you know what one is? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, it's like, how do you know if you're burnt out? If you don't put like, how do you know what a burnout is? If you're avoiding burnout in your job, but you never worked hard enough to get anywhere close to it, then you could probably work hard. It's exactly the same thing when it comes to yeah. training. So I like those sort of like pushing people past that because especially if there's any new coaches listening to this, it's a skill. I bet you nowadays you can just pick a weight and it's probably right. Like when we talk about one rep maxes and a potential one rep maxes, right? I'm presuming most of your beginners, you're not testing one rep maxes because yeah, it wouldn't be safe to do so. So you now yeah. have an eye and you just like, it's hard to explain to somebody yeah. how to do it because you've got to go, you pick up the weight and you give it them and it's nearly always right. So doing something like that means if if they go over three reps, let's say you've got three sets of 10 as you used, if they do three more than three reps on that last set, you know you can increase the weight next set. If they, if yeah. they don't hit the rep range, you know it was too heavy. If they get one or two more, perfect. So like, what do you do in, in terms of like maximizing the set? How do you make sure someone can safely get to technical or muscular failure? Because this is the thing, right? Because what happens with beginners often is they have no stability. I'm giving you the answer here, but they have all this sort of stuff. How do you make sure that somebody is in a position to push hard enough to get that response? Well, you know, first of all, like, so for anyone that doesn't understand, the overload principle is basically in order to, for you to progress, you have to put the body under a certain amount of stress and then it will adapt, providing we recover, etc. cetera. General adaptation syndrome, right? Um, the gas principle. But to describe, we, we, you can use a fit model to describe how we may apply additional stress. And that's the FITT model, which is your frequency, your intensity, your time, and your type of training that, like exercise that you use. Yeah. So the simple one is, you know, we can intensity, we can manipulate the reps, the load, and like how difficult the exercise is that way. Um, and you can even change the type of exercise. So you can, you know, change in moment arms to make something harder. So you can tweak that sort of stuff. But first and foremost, technique needs to be down, you know, and then we can apply more stress to progress. But there's also implications for progressive ov overload. Like people think progressive overload is just simply adding more resistance when it's not. It's, it's can we... I like to think like, can we progress tension? All right, there's different ways to progress tension, you know? Um, you know, like we can take the same weight and to progress this next week, we can just move that weight faster, right? Or, or the opposite. In, with the beginners often like, I, I always look at this like an inverted U. With beginners, yeah. my progression is moving slower. My progression is, can I put more tension on this muscle? Because I could add load to a bench press and you could, in theory, on paper, your logbook says you're progressively overloading. But what are you progressively overloading? Are you progressively overloading your chest? Or are you progressively overloading your delts? Now, yeah. there could be a structural component in this, right? There could be um, the fact that you, you've got a really, really sh like flat rib cage, And maybe bench press isn't the best exercise for you. But there are so many people out there that don't know how to actually do the bench press properly to create tension learning to slow down and putting more tension week on week in the same sets, reps and load will do more for your chest training than any log book progression ever will in those early yeah. stages. And then when you've nailed yeah. that down, you can go quicker. You can add load, you can add sets, you can add reps, you can do whatever, because I've seen it. You know, like how people talk about beginner growth. I think the beginner growth and I'm done. You, you probably agree with me. I don't know if you do or not, but I think beginner growth is isolated to beginners. I think beginner growth comes from when a tissue is stimulated for the first time. I've known people that have been training for years yeah. and are fairly well developed. They have never been able to grow their chest is always the one, right? Because people yeah. press terribly. And I teach them how to gauge their chest or find an exercise that best, best suits their mechanics and the chest goes really quickly. They haven't added more weight. And, 
They've just yeah, yeah, I <laughs> totally like that. It's like biological age and then training age, right? You know, mm. like some people they they might be fifty, but they have a poor training age and experience, right? So and then they get exposed to true tension and training, and they progress. But check this, like you know, I've had a back and knee injury for a few years now, and I haven't been able to maximize my training. I also haven't had any whey protein and I haven't for about three years and I've just been sort of just floating with my nutrition, not, you know, proper nutrition. And then um, the last six, seven weeks, I started following an old program that I had from John Meadows. So it's a real pure bodybuilding. Brutal program. high volume. <laughs> high volume. I feel like I've got sunburn <laughs> every day. Yeah, and um, and again, it's it's a lot of challenge sets, like we spoke about. It's one of the reasons that I started doing this with my clients as well. Like you mentioned it, and then and then in the program, the first week I had fucking challenge sets on my leg extension. You know what I mean? Blood flow restriction challenge sets, as many reps as I could for fuck's sake. Um, but I'm loving it. And in four weeks, yeah, I started to eat better, more calories, um, well, the right amount of calories, more protein, and I started taking whey protein again and. I put about four kilos on in five weeks. You know what I mean? So, how like, do you think that's yeah. placebo, like psychology, in the sense of because I see this in, like all the time with clients. Yeah, when you get them to love training, and when you train them hard, this this is such a value to training a client hard because yeah. they leave and they go, "I don't want to ruin that session." So you go into a high volume block, which is a bit alien to you because you're so used to strength stuff and you can kind of do the strength stuff in your sleep. Doing something that's out of your comfort zone that is hard, oh, you go, I don't want to, I, like, is, is it the nutrition that's enabled, the training that's enabled you to eat better or is it because the training's so hard, you go, I, I don't want to eat shit after that. It's, it's, it's definitely both like, and also like, you know, like social dynamics as well. Like the missus, is trying to diet and eat well. You know what I'm saying? So mm. that helps as well. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't feel like having, you know, I haven't had any alcohol for five weeks, you know, which is rare for me, mm. you know? And, but I feel good. I feel really, really good. I'm sleeping good and I'm training really well. And um, I've got good energy and recovery. So, you know what I mean? And I'm an experienced trainee, you know? So those are other factors that I've just tweaked that you wouldn't think may affect me that much, but they, they big time did, you know? Yeah. Do you um, think another thing that affects, I think affects people in the, in the set to get that acute response, to like enough of a stimulus. Do you think a lot of coaches progress their clients too fast? So they have an exercise that it's too advanced for them. So they can't create that tension. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time. And that, that's like, like, you know, when they say like the, um, the art of training, right? The art of being able to train someone and the art of manipulating these principles and techniques, you know what I mean? Like, again, you can change the type of exercise to make something more stressful, like tweak how you they may be creating moment arms or, um, you know what I mean? Stuff like that, you know, different barbells and stuff like that. And people don't really know how to progress that. Um, I have a I have a love hate relationship with the the big three barbell lifts, and this is where we might disagree. Yeah, so. I do as well. I do as well yeah. now. Yeah, I feel like as I become more experienced as a coach and more experienced within my own training, I use the barbell less and less every week. Yeah, I you like know? it. I like it from a perspective of. So I went away from them completely when I went into the mechanic stuff. Like I said, like so few people are gifted to, to do these when the goal is body composition. Put powerlifting mm -hmm. aside because you need to do them. So I was like, ah, oh, I never do it. And then I was like thinking, well, I love the fact that there's a skill component to squat, bench, and deadlift. That it's something that you can have longevity in your training. So when you're not focused on, I need to get leaner or I need to get bigger, to just make your training fun for years on end, getting better at something that you will always have a weak spot on, adds longevity. So you can always add load to a bar. There's only so much load you can add to a leg press. So for, for you know, I love them in that sense, but I do think they are the curse that everyone thinks they're the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. And they progress the client so fast that they don't get anywhere near that stimulus. If someone can't 
properly do a back squat? Why don't I regress them to a goblet squat? Why don't I regress them to a hack squat? Why don't I regress them to a leg press? They can get Listen. way more out of that, especially if the yeah. goal is to build muscle. And then if you want to progress them down the line, awesome. I get I get people send me videos sometimes of like their friend or whoever, like deadlifting. I had someone this morning, one of my um, online clients send me uh, a video of his younger brother um, doing a doing a deadlift. And his back's all flexed over. He's doing it quite poorly, quite dangerously. But he's lifting heavy weight. He's lifting 140, 150-ish heavy weight for a young lad. He said, oh, what, Steve, how can he improve this? And I, I, you know, I said what I said. Um, stop deadlifting and try this instead. You know, he needs to learn how to brace and pivot. And maybe he can learn that here. Good mornings, back extensions, simple stuff. I think, again, like, you know, people are doing these big exercises without thinking of the consequences, you know, of, you know, long training, longevity, they are going to break down. Um, and that's our jobs as coaches and people that are on social media to teach them, isn't it? You know what I mean? That These are the things you do have to think about, you know? Do you find, um, like, now you you have a better understanding of how to regress things and where the weak links in the chain are? Nowadays, I used to try and focus on teaching everyone and like get people like they just didn't get it. And I'll be spending so much time trying to coach them. And I'm like, if they don't get it quickly, it's because I've progressed them way too quickly. So I regress yeah. to a point where it's so easy for them to do, like they get it like that. And then I work up. Um, and I found yeah. where if like if someone I had like a client that would that generally really couldn't move, couldn't squat, couldn't do anything. So okay, right, I got them good at leg extensions, I got them good at incline hypers and hip thrusts, I got them good at leg curls, I got them good at a goblet squat. Right. And each of those little individual things, like learn to move your knee, learn to move your ankle, learn to move your hip. And after a while, when I went into a back squat, I took him into a safety bar. Like he was never getting under a bar. He was so kypotic. And I was like, okay, let's just try this. And I was like, this is gonna be terrible. And it was perfect. Yeah. Because two things. One. I got them strong at each individual component. So all you had to do is put them all together. And two, I, I mastered his setup. I knew he was long, so I elevated his heels. I knew, and he also I knew how long his femurs were, so I took him a wider stance. I also knew he couldn't get under a bar, so I gave him a safety bar. And because of those things, like he, there was nothing in his head that was difficult to understand. He just had to move. Apologies for the drilling, but anyone listening to this, I don't know what's happened in my house. <laughs> it, it's all good. The the um that's the thing that you know and and right right rightfully as well like people don't understand that weight training resistance training strength training for any goal requires lots of skill and um central nervous system stimulation you know like it's it's all a skill whether that's endurance you know you could have endurance skill strength skill movement skill and style of skill What's their strategy to execute that skill? You know what I mean? So um, that's really, really important for training longevity, um, you know, being skillful with what you do. And people, like you're saying, like they put the barbell lift, the squat bench and deadlift. And I might have done this in the past, put it up there as this is where, what we need to get to. And there's no, that, that, that's good that we can strive towards this because it's, you know, it has, you know, it's fun. Yeah, you know, it gives us a guide to work towards, but not everyone needs to achieve that. You know what I mean? Um, you know, not everyone needs to front squat, back squat, deadlift. Exactly. You know? I've, I've had I've had people get great results without any of those lifts. People get with an incline dumbbell press and a hip thrust and a goblet squat and a leg press, and then like that's all that it's all they need. And I think sometimes people feel like a failure because they need to go. They think they need to go to these levels, or why can't I do what he does? Like, you're not comparing yourself to that person. You know, and I think, um, yeah, I think like um, people that preach those those exercises or method or any methods, you know, like weightlifters, oh, you know, this is the best way to produce for athletes for power or powerlifters. This is the best way to get max strong or like there's different ways to create different magnitudes of force, right? You know, like as we know, it's simple, isn't it? Like when the mass is large and the weight is heavy, your speed acceleration is going to be small. And the reverse, when the mass is small and the acceleration will be large. So, you know, powerlifting, 
heavy loads, probably slower speeds. And um, the opposite would be like maybe, um, you know, when the, the mass is small, the speed, the, the speed is fast, you know, maybe like athletics, you know, or something like that. And then there's the, the, the bit in between, which is more physique and bodybuilding, right? You need to use moderate weights and moderate speeds, you know? Um, I think once, when you understand that, then you don't need to follow one approach. You know, you don't always have to think, oh, barbells are the way for this or weightlifting is the way for this. You know what I mean? Like we can use different approaches. You know? do, you think, do you think it's goal dependent? I was recently did a, a three hour seminar with Tom Hibbert. Obviously he's a primarily strength guy and the methods used for progression when he looks at um, strength training, a very low base percentage based, um, it's very, very mathematical and analytical but when, he, when I spoke to him about hypertrophy, he was like, well, you just need to train within one to five reps of failure. So what is the training system that allows your client to train hard? It doesn't, as long as they can recover from it, it doesn't really matter what it is. Do you agree with that? Do you think it's goal dependent on, on how we progress things? I think that's, um, like, I understand what that, that I understand that, you know, way of thinking, but I think it's quite a narrow way of thinking. You know, what about the individual's longevity? You know, how, you know, like we're talking about progressive overload and, and you know, that principle, like I said, isn't just about adding weight or stimulating muscle or wh whatever, you know. There's a big psychological component to it as well, you know, mm. and people will get stagnant and the central nervous system still needs to be stimulated. So that could be exercise variation, et cetera. So whether you're training for hypertrophy or not. So goal dependent, yes, but for progress and longevity, no, because, you know, things still need to be fun, right? Why yeah. not? If you, can pro if you can systemize something and progress it, then why not do it? You know, why not have a plan? I also think sure. as well that, the majority of the people listening to this, the majority of the population, pure strength athletes don't, they obviously, but they probably do want to get a little bit bigger, but they don't really care as long as the numbers on the bar go up. Bodybuilders probably do want to get stronger, but they don't care so much as long as they actually look better at the end of the day. Most people mm. fall somewhere in the middle where even if they've got a goal closer to the bodybuilder, if their strength isn't going up, what that does to somebody psychologically that may affect the nutrition, like we spoke about with yourself earlier, could be massive. So if we know that nutrition is such a driving force behind the way we look, then we need something that allows the client to feel like they're progressing over time so they can build confidence and confidence and feel like they're going somewhere. And in turn, the nutrition, the recovery, all these things tend to come together. I had a client um, here in Hong Kong, big drinker. Right, big social drinker, all the way through his diet, big social drinker. He's now better with his drink when he's not dieting, the time where he can get away with it. Why? Because he's got to a level now where he's training really, really hard. He's progressing week on week. So he doesn't want to ruin it. He doesn't like that feeling of coming in a bit worse for wear. So because of that, he's starting slowly but surely to dial in all the other factors of his life without me ever having to ask him. Mm, mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, I think, you know, like, yeah, go on, next one, let's move on. <laughs> do you, uh, but so on that note, though, do you choose different methods of progression in different phases yourself? So if someone's in an accumulation phase, like a high volume phase or an intensification phase, or someone's fat loss versus muscle gain versus strength, is there different things you'll use in different phases in terms of progression? There's a certain phase where you'll progress more load and density and rest periods and tempos compared to others. Um, yeah, it definitely depends on the, obviously the goals and the individual's ability to um, recover. You know what I mean? Um, if I've got a young lad, then I'm going to push more intensive intensity based methods. Like I might use drop sets more and I might use, um, you know, stuff, stuff like that, you know, whereas someone who's older to progress them, I might use um, maybe different styles of supersets you know, um, like that. So I have a, a, a general gut, like rule, you know, and then um, I just tweak it depending on the individual. And What's um, your general rule? To, like we've discussed on previous 
um, chats use a just a simple, subtle, linear model of progression. And I progress the load because that's the easiest to control. I keep every other variable the same and I just progress load, 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 load. Um, you progress week to week, block to block, or a bit of both? Week, week to week. If they're technically sufficient, I progress week to week. Mm. Yeah, quite simple. Uh, you know, if you change something and increase, you know, for example, if we if we increase volume load by more than 10%, the chances of injuries goes up dramatically. So you can't just, you know, go from a, you know, an exercise to something else that allows them to lift a ton more weight because the risk of injury goes up, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, they might be ready to do it, but you know, there's more than 10% increase in, you know, mm. the change of that exercise or rep scheme was incorrect. Mm. So like you mentioned earlier on about progressing tempo. So, and obviously now you said in your blue blocks, you're currently progressing weight. What are the other metrics of progression that someone could look at? Let's say they've, they've been hitting the same weight for the same few weeks. They've got their execution down because they've taken our tips from earlier on um, and they, they're lifting with a, a decent tempo. And they're now feeling a little bit stagnant in the training. And let's now assume this is a training issue because we can go down a wormhole of sleep and nutrition and all this stuff that could affect it. What other methods of progressive overload could you do in that example? I might, um, you know, the, the simplest one I would do is give them a longer rest period. Hmm. Yeah, I would just simply increase their rest period. If, if the goal was to, okay, I want to get a progression here on load or I want them to hit their rep target, before I change anything, I will just give them longer rest periods to see if they can replenish energy and then, mm. you know, hit the rep range or hit the, it hit the heavier load. That's the first thing I would do. Mm. And then the second thing I would do is speed up the tempo so i would i would um take out that you know if we're going down in five seconds for example i'll say don't worry about your tempo get down get back up yes use a bit more momentum and more of your stretch reflex and and move that weight faster I'll why 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 that choice because you can make an argument for both sides of the coin so why do you tend to lean towards quicker if they're technically good then mm -hmm. i'll use that and if they don't have any joint problems or any problems lifting then i'll use that as well because if they can generate more speed on the movement that's also like i said a way of them progressing mm -hmm. because they are now producing more mechanical tension me 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 mechanical tension isn't just load on the bar mechanical tension is also speed that's what people forget to talk about when they talk about mechanical tension all right, heavy deadlifting because of mechanical tension. Well, uh, mechanical tension is also a lighter load, but moving that weight fucking fast. Yeah. That's how we can create mechanical tension and activate those high threshold muscle units. So speed is a component of the progress, you know? What? And, and it's a confidence thing, right? And it's a confidence thing. Move that weight fucking fast. Get it down, get it back up. If it's for a, a couple of reps or a last set, so what? As long as they're not getting injured. So with that, Next week, with, slow that down. with that on mind, with that in mind, we, we we've said at the start of this that mechanical tension is the thing that is the biggest driver of hypertrophy. And you're saying that increasing training or rep speed will create more mechanical tension as well as load. What would you say? Because for ages, everyone was talking about eccentrics, that longer eccentrics had a better driving force for hypertrophy. So in essentially, you're saying the opposite. And I, I think I know where you're going with this, but why? Because there's going to be people asking that question. I heard going slow on the eccentric was better. Going slower on an eccentric is good because you'll create more muscle tension hmm. on the negative. You, you, but you, it's less metabolically. Um, you use less energy on the way down on an eccentric, which is why it's easier to lift heavier load. So it's it, less. Yeah. That's where the biggest misconception is, isn't it, about an eccentric? Because it actually is lighter because you're, you're, you're not overcoming force. You're yes. resisting force. Resisting force, and your body uses less energy to do that. Mm. Yep. 
Yeah, I, I wrote a little article on my website that people can have a look at. I, I wrote it on um, um, overloading, like overloading methods, like eccentric overloading methods. Um, and I talk all about eccentric contractions there, um, where people can have. It has a little. Has give, a little give, give us the clip. Give us the clip notes. I'm gonna pull it up quickly <laughs> on my. Uh, I think what whilst 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 you're doing that. I think I think this is the important thing to to talk about here is that when we're looking at mechanical tension, we're essentially looking at improving training volume, right? So for those who don't know, training volume sets times reps times load is the, the simplest way of looking at this. There's, there's potential many definitions of it, but we, everyone used to think that muscle damage was the biggest thing that drove hypertrophy, right? So yeah. I I damage my muscles and they would grow back stronger. But if I let's say if I gave you a really long eccentric leg workout with tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons, and tons of volume. That may sound good, but the amount of load you lift in your A series compared to your C series would be drastically dropped. Then if I meant to try to do another leg session later in the week, you'd still be so battered mentally and physically that the performance of that session would go down. So the potential argument of doing something like this, where you maybe create less muscle damage, but you allow overall, you lift more load, you create more mechanical tension, and then you can do the same later in the week overall your training volume for the week is dramatically more than if you did a massive leg day and couldn't go to the toilet for 14 days. Have you, have you used many eccentric methods before? In my own training? Mm. Yes. Like what sort of methods have you used? I mean, oh my God. I mean, like I, I, I've done phases where I've done incredibly so eccentrics. I've done phases with eccentric hooks. Um, cool. I, I, yeah, I, I, I've, I've used a lot of bands and chains for those sort of things a little bit as well. Um, but I'm, I, I'm sure there's tons more I haven't played with. And then that's it. Like we've spoken before, there's different types of eccentric contractions, right? You get slow concentric, uh, so, slow eccentrics, fast eccentrics, super maximal eccentrics, which is you know lifting um, hooks and stuff like that. Um, it's one of the reasons why I don't like people when they do, um, they use. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I, I'm not saying this doesn't work. I just don't like the way people explain it and the way they um, term it and the way they use it as a progression. They use um, negative reps on the chin up to help someone progress to doing a chin up. So okay. they always say, do isometric okay. holds. Then the next progression step is to do eccentrics or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing a body weight eccentric because you can't do one pull up, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't pull yourself up and you decided to, to do negatives on the way down, that is a supra maximal eccentric contraction. So explain that for people that don't know the terminology. A supra maximal eccentric contraction is using a weight that is heavier than what you can lift. Mm -hmm. That is an advanced method. That's an advanced method. That's like, well, it's not, but it, you could say that's like going in and making someone do a one rep max. Why not? Because it's an advanced technique. It's, it's, it's worse than that. That's like getting a spotter that can upright row more than your bench press. To put more load in the bar than you can handle. That's what I'm saying, bro. I'm saying you don't get someone going to do a 100-meter sprint. Like, I've got an old client who can do a max effort sprint, right? He can still do his attempt of a, one, of a max effort fucking sprint. Doesn't mean I'm – why would I let him do that? That's just stupid, <laughs> right? So, like, that, you know, how do I progress him to it if that's the goal? It's like the chin-up. Well, what you think an ISO now we can do super maximal eccentrics? Like, how they, they, that's not the step process to achieve chin ups. This is an advanced method that you're trying to use on someone who can't do chin ups. Do you get what your, I'm what is your progression to getting someone their first chin up? I would just make them really strong with their whole upper body, man. Like, strong fucking pull downs strong rows and, and then can they can they hold the top position of a chin up with load you know what i mean um i think 
Now, this is the thing. I'm not saying that eccentrics on the chin up won't work because they, they will, they can work for some people. But I, I, I actually think if we took all of these thousands of people, millions of people who do them and all these hundreds and thousands of coaches that promote this progression of ISOs, try these eccentrics. How many of you get results? I want to see your results. I want to see your client do the ISOs. Now I want to fucking see your client do the eccentrics. And I don't care if it's in 12 weeks or 12 months. I want to see them progress because of those, that method of the, 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 the eccentrics. You're not going to fucking see it. You're not going to fucking see it. It doesn't fucking work like people promote. It yeah. doesn't work. I, abs I absolutely agree with you. And I, I always remember, like, most of the people that I've gotten doing chin-ups, and there's a good few of them, most of them, I never trained for it. One day, it just says, you want to do a chin-up? Let's try if you can see if you can do one first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, remember, yeah. I remember we had uh, my client May, um, still a client of mine online, um, really strong deadlifter. She, so she, she got up to 145 kilo deadlift from the floor. Like strong, strong woman. And we just did work. On, she got lighter. So she lost 20 kilos and she got really strong at pull downs. So she did her first photo shoot and the photographer asked her, could, uh, could you do, can you do a chin up? She goes, oh, I don't think so. She goes, okay, what we'll do is we'll get you to jump up to the top. Like Simon can help you. And then I'll take um, a photo quickly and then you just come down. So we, I help her up to the top and she sits there and she's holding it for like five, 10 minutes. He snaps those shots. So she was really surprised she could hold this position. Never trained for it, never done it. We just pull downs, deadlifts, rows. She comes in after the shoot on the Monday. I went, show me any chin ups you can do. I was like, I don't think I can do any. Show me 11. Wow. That's amazing. You know, and, and like, That's I, amazing. We never and it's the same with everything else. And I, it, when I look back at the people I did eccentric with, probably never got them doing chin ups. Exactly. You're not, you, you're, the goal is to do a chin up. An eccentric, you're learning how to do a chin down. You're not. Watching a banded, watching a banded chin ups, because I hate them in the same way that. If you can do, bands are good to help you. If you can do one chin up and, and you can't do any more, I think bands are a good idea. If, you, if it's going to help you get volume and repetitions, but to go from zero to one, bands aren't a good idea because it doesn't match the strength curve. I much prefer exercise. a chin-up machine. You now when you put your knees on them because that, that is consistently helping you from bottom to top as opposed to this, that when you actually really need the help, there is nothing there. Yeah. And they curl into all sorts of positions trying to get that top position. It's not helping anyone. It's actually, really, I think it's enforcing bad habits because when they need the help, they don't have the help. So they just curl up into a weird, like, spasticated ball. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think um, like, top position isometrics are really, really good to get people Agreed. comfortable up there in a good scapular position, um, feeling the back working, feeling the arms working. Pull downs are obviously good because you can really build some good foundational pulling strength yeah um yeah i think that's i think that's that's a good start so yeah 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 there, there's my um there's my take on trainers who um think part of a progression is eccentric chin-ups and i can say that because i've got girls that can do 25 kilo chin-ups i've got girls that can do 15 reps i think that's pretty good i may mate, mate, i know i know yeah, like you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think people take these statements and just put it out there. Well, they've never fucking done it with success. So, you know. Question I was going to ask you. This is, this is maybe sound like an obvious one, but I think it's, it's one that I get asked so often. Does sauna equal a good workout? Um, it may indicate a fun workout, <laughs> right? Which is a big part of, um, you know, training. Having a fun workout, feeling sore. Um, well, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I, my view is probably similar to yours. You know, I, I don't think it does, but um, it is nice to feel like that, right? The psychology we have behind feeling sore. Um, but I tell you what, you know, I got, I, I trained a mother and a daughter, and we've we've spent twelve months just doing lots of. Um, hypertrophy work, strength work, um, you know, learning how to train sort of stuff. 
lift heavy weights, moderate loads, all different sort of uh, methods over the last 12 to 18 months. And then um, I decided to um, move them into some uh, reps to failure, so um, um, challenge sets and stuff like that. And they were doing like real high reps with fairly decent weights, yeah, like real high reps. And they were fucking, they were smashed after the workouts, you know, they were all, they were leaving feeling depressed, like they hated it, they didn't like it. And they come in two days later and they weren't sore. They thought they were going to be the sorest they have ever been. They weren't sore, mm. you know? So, mm. you know, um, that's the case of, that's the reverse case, you know, where people think like lots of reps and lots of work is going to make them have a good effective workout. But, you know, it doesn't mean they didn't have a good effective workout because they weren't, weren't sore, right? There's uh, so many factors to what makes a good workout as well, right? Like, I think you get two kinds of people. You get the people who um, chase a soreness. So if, it, if I don't feel sore, then maybe the workout wasn't good. Where, as we said earlier on, that there's an element where soreness actually is a hindrance because it actually means that your overall training volume will come down because you can't lift as much load on the next session. And there's also, if you're increasing a in load, your mechanical tension or execution is getting better, you don't need to be sore. And there is an every time you get a new block, you, you might feel sore because it's a new stimulus. But you get yeah, the other people... No, yeah. Let's get the other people that get sore and they hate it, hate it with a passion and you block and think that this is this is where it has to be. When actually like two, three weeks in, this is gonna this is gonna subside yeah. a little bit. I mean, as you know, there's a lot of variables to being sore, isn't it? You know, like you know, um training volume. Um, you know, I you know, I'm sure you when you think about this, you probably have the same bunch of clients that you get some clients that get really sore when they're doing lots of work and lots of volume. And then you get some clients that get really, really sore when they lift heavy ass weights for low reps. And then you've got the ones in between as well, right? Like, um, so like the girls there, they didn't get sore and they probably banged out fucking three, 400 reps on their legs, you know? They didn't get sore. They weren't, they were fine. But if I give them like fucking 10 sets of three, for example, um, with a real heavy weight with three minute recoveries, they'll be fucking sore all week. It's a different so, yeah, sore. Yeah. It's a different sore as well, right? When I do like a like a Milos giant set, high volume workout, I'm sore. I, I'm waddling. I can't sit down on the toilet. Like it's, it sucks. But on the flip side of that, if I do a heavy strength workout, especially if I'm in a stable exercise, I did a phase once where I did um, five times five on a pendulum squat, like a banded pendulum squat. So horrible. Yeah, but lo but low volume, high intensive, low volume. I felt sore, but I wasn't battered. It's a really different sore. I just felt just overall fatigued. It was a deep soreness, but I could move. So mm. soreness depends on the activity. Soreness doesn't dictate a good workout, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, it's that fitness fatigue model, isn't it, of recovery, you know? Like, um, there's a research, I don't know who, like, coins it or termed it. They basically say there's, like, a three times the recovery to recover from something. So like, say if you do um, a bench workout and then you, you, you know, it took you two days to recover fatigue and muscular soreness, it will actually take three times that to fully recover. Mm. So it's a two day turnaround for feeling better, but it's actually a six day recovery before you should maybe go in and do the exercise again and really get the benefits, you know? Um, but obviously that's exercise dependent as well. You know what I mean? You know that if you lift really heavy deadlift session, you know, that could take you a lot longer than doing um, calves or forearms, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it, absolutely. And, and if it's a new muscle you haven't trained, if you've never trained calves before, or if you've never yeah, trained calves true. before, or you've had a long layoff or something, that's going to hurt. Like I, I had, sorry, go on. I had a long, I had a long, bit long layoff and I went home. Like I did a few sessions, nothing major. And that was just my, my bigger lifts really, right? I did an arm session on Sunday. The first proper arm session I've done in a very, very long time. My biceps were destroyed. <laughs> destroyed. And this, yeah. is, this was the workout, right? Um, for the biceps. I did um, A series, um, incline curls, preacher, single arm preacher, B series, and hammer curls on the C. That was it. Two, two sets. Yeah. Six to, six to ten. Beat and, up a week. Whew, man, like three or four days. Really sore. But if I do that next week, I'll probably be fine in 24 hours. 
I, I yeah, I had a, a female um, last year. She did. Um, she just did a. You know, she probably did like a set of twenty five. One set of twenty five. I think it was thirty reps, like a standing calf raise or something. She was at the physios the next day. She thought she tore her calves off. She went to the physios. You know what I mean? Like she, she thought she like tore her fucking Achilles off or whatever. I was like, that's just extreme muscle soreness. <laughs> I also think as well, girls probably find calf workouts harder because they're wearing heels. Mm -hmm. they're, they're on them. Like, like, you know how people always complain about leg soreness? When people complain about leg soreness. That's the one that people often freak out about. But it's because leg soreness, you have to walk on your legs, right? How yeah, often do you get chest soreness? You don't, you don't, you literally the next day you feel fine, you don't even feel sore. And then you stretch or yawn, and you're like, oh yeah, my yeah. God. Yeah. Like you, you, say, you don't you know feeling? it. They go like that and they're like, oh, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I remember similar to your story with the, the car. So, Cause like, you know, I've had problems with my, my T-spine for as, nearly as long as I've known you. And I sometimes now when, I, when I'm starting to move better and I'm starting to get into muscles that I struggle to and I find exercises that work around my structure, and I get into those exercises. Sometimes I go, man, my back's really rough today. And sometimes it's hard to separate DOMS from the pains I normally get when I'm just not looking after myself. So it, it can be quite similar. And it's, it's, yeah. it's sometimes good to look back and go, okay, look, I trained that yesterday. That's probably why everything's feeling really, really stiff. And I think it's people misunderstand soreness so much. I think it's a problem or I think it's necessary. And as everything, the answer's, answer's in the middle yeah definitely definitely and 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 i think it's like you know if 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 you train the majority of your year using heavy loads and uh, that's that's where you come back and do volume based work so it's just to allow your body to recover mm. whereas the reverse is probably true you know like for those people that train a ton of volume like maybe bodybuilders and people that just push fat loss sort of stuff and very moderate to high rep stuff you know having a break is probably doing the heavy lifting actually you know what i mean for their bodies so that's the big uh, thing the biggest misconception i think people have about deloading is they look at it is in terms of, of a very like standardized set of terms in that I, i'm going to deload that means i'll do half the weight or do half the load or i just have an easy week now i'm not saying you can't have a week outside the gym as a deload if you want to take a break from the gym and get outside and do stuff then that's brilliant i'm, I'm all for that but if you don't mm. want to like there's two, there's, there's different ways of overtraining. Like over, like if you're overtraining on the high volume stuff, you'll get joint pain. You'll be sore for longer. You know, you'll, you'll get some like tendonitis -y type of stuff if you're really pushing it. So then doing the heavy stuff gives you a break from that. If you do all the heavy stuff, you'll see more nervous system stuff. You'll see sleep being impaired. You'll see like yeah. brain fog and fatigue. And they're both overtraining, but they're very different. And then you just need to switch the stimulus. And this is why I think a lot of people like yourself use an undulating model of accumulation intensification when you're not doing yeah. linear. Yeah. And, and that's it. And, and like uh, coming back to the story that everyone uses for progressive overload, uh, the Milo story, yeah? The Grecian Italian, you know, the Milo story, right? He, he as a child, he would carry the buffalo. Oh, the yes. Up the hill every day. And every day he would do it, the buffalo would get bigger, but he would, the overload principle, you know, like he would get stronger every day, right? He's lifting more weight every day, but he would adapt to it. But I mean, yeah, at a simple, in simplified terms, yes. But that actually contra in, like contradicts um, the, the, the method of periodization because we don't actually do that. <laughs> we don't just keep, do it. We, Milo never took a rest day, bro. We would it, would, take rest would that be nice, though? We'd all be Eddie yeah. Hall within a year. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. But it doesn't work like that, does it? So it's, it's, we need to think of it as an, a wave, a wave, a, a way, a progress. As long as we're still going positive, but we need to wave the okay. progressive overload. On that note, because I think this is where coaches tend to struggle. So let's say I can do four phase blocks. So we go through, let's say, intensification one, accumulation one, intensification two, accumulation two, or, or vice versa, you want to end on intensification. So you're, you're maximizing intensity, right? So you've, over time, let's say you've gone 70%, 74%, six, you know, 72%, 78%. Let's 
let's say, say Ross, you've increased it over time, right? Now, there's, surely there's going to be a point eventually where you cannot keep increasing. When you start getting to the, the 90% realms, there's, there's a point a... where you hit a wall. What do you do in those situations? Because you've got to keep training going for years and years and years and years and years. And you can't just increase that... growth forever. Yeah, that, 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 that's called a... Um... There's something called a performance growth curve. Okay. And that's what stops people, Paul, that's what stops an individual from constantly breaking world records. Mm. You know, you only have so much genetic potential and there's only so much you can do. Um, is that answer your question? Or are you, is it more simplified to what you're asking me? If, you, if, if you're looking from a pro perspective, right? So let's say I go through a year's worth of training, right? And eventually I end up on, I don't know, 90, 95%. You're getting really close to your one minute max territory. You've done this undulating model. You've increased the intensity. Where do I go from there? Well, that's where we can play around with um, those, those um, your frequency, your intensity, mm -hmm. the time that you train, the type of, training that you use, the type of exercise and stuff like that, right? You know, you could, you could bring in, um, like, let's, let's take frequency. You could decrease the amount of, you know, that lift that you're doing and then get benefits, right? You know, potentially, you know, you could deadlift less, you know, maybe squat more. Mm. That may help your, your deadlift go up because we know that squatting will help deadlifting most of the time, whereas deadlifting may not always help your squat. So you can like maybe tweak the frequency, you know, like it's some, there are a lot of strong motherfuckers that deadlift once every two weeks. There's some people that like to squat every two weeks or bench press three times a week. You know, to, you know what I mean? There's different frequency variables that you can play with, or you could play with the time of your, training session you know you know maybe do, do um you know if you were lucky enough to have the time maybe you could do two training sessions a day you know you could do if you're trying to improve your um bench let's just take strength for example yeah like if you're trying to improve your bench maybe you could do some heavy ex um, uh, heavy lifting in the morning and then in the pm you can do more moderate to light loads right am pm sessions or you can manipulate the, um, the type of exercises that you're using. You know, you can manipulate the moment arms. You know, you could go from doing a barbell back squat and front squat that you've been doing for the last 12 months. And how about you now start using a safety bar or a cambered bar and things like that. So there are ways to manipulate it. It just depends on what you have access to and your level of training experience, you know. When people look at manipulating strength curves with the rise of mechanics, this is something that's become so popular to use bands, chains, reverse bands, cables. Um, what ways do you use to create a full range challenge when you have minimal equipment? Because obviously you've had a, you've got a decent home gym now, but as we spoke about last week, that's developed over time. So if we look at, let's say, delts, for example, we know from the resistance profile and strength profile do not match. So the position where we are weakest, the weight is heaviest, and then this bit's pretty much, the bottom bit's pretty much useless. So if you don't have, the easy way to say this is we'll do a cable lateral raise, which allows a drop off at the top. What could you do if you have minimal equipment and people have got exercises like that? How do they start to begin thinking about troubleshooting this and finding solutions? How can you manipulate your body angle? Hmm that we change the axis of where we are creating talk. So you know, how would like, you do that with a client? Well, I mean, yes, you know, we, we may, um, you know, when you hold onto a rack, you may lean over to the side, create a angle of the torso and then do your dumbbell raise if you only have a dumbbell. Or you can use a bench and go the opposite way. So there's ways to manipulate. Like, I think a lot of people, which is okay, you know, to do, I think a lot of people simplify biomechanics and applied biomechanics. I think it's a lot more complex than we think, you know, people sure. just assume there is 
one like you know the moment arms and all this there's 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 internal moment arms and there's external moment arms all right external yes, moment exactly. arms and we have dumbbell internal moment arms are you know tendon attachments and shit like that and we all have different um tendon attachments you know depending on your genetics you know some people have long achilles tendons some people have short achilles tendons there are different class levers you know um, there's a first class lever, second class lever, and a third class lever. These will change how your body produces force and torque and um, how the muscle works. You know, like the calf is different to the bicep and the bicep is different to the bench press. You know, like, so, you know what I mean? Like, it's good to simplify these things for people, but um, so it's almost like too simplified, you know, sometimes. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think it's just finding like, what it what is you looking at optimal versus practical, right? Mm. One of the things I would always use in, using that example of the latch raise, I, either the lean, which I quite like. I also like the if I did a dumbbell latch raise, let's say whatever load you can lift for, let's say you can do fours up here, fatigue this top part of the motion where you're weaker. Go and grab yourself a set of twelves or fifteens and just do swings par partial weight, and then you can challenge the length and range. You can find a weight that challenges that part after you fatigue the top part, and then you you get the whole round spectrum. In the same way that if you wanted to do your full range challenge for your lats, you do pull downs, and then you do also do rows. But but this is the thing as well, like you know, um, peak torques and peak tensions. You're like, you know, that bottom position is still important to train. You know, because what muscle works down here in the first thirty degrees is a small little muscle. It's the supraspinatus. Mm. Still needs to be trained, not because of hypertrophy reasons, but for structural reasons. Yeah. Right. So we still need to train that range, you know, and that's the argument of um, why partial repetitions and not full range of motion isn't, you know, um, well, one full of range of motion type. for what? Right. And this is the problem with full range of motion. People love. People go, you got to train full range, full range for the exercise, or full range for what? Full range of the muscle. What muscle? Right. Yeah. Full range of motion. Like there isn't anything that's full range, truly full range of motion, unless mm. you're looking externally, which is for most people's training. Is some ways irrelevant. Yeah, you get a full yeah. range challenge for a muscle for most people, and that doesn't always mean full range of an exercise. Yeah, yeah, de totally, totally, and um, yeah, yeah, that was, that's a good topic to discuss actually. Biomechanics mm. and levers and moment yeah. arms. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's next week. So on that note, so I know you've got to got to shoot off. Just a closing question: If there was one bit of advice you hear someone like they they're a bit stagnating in their workout. And they want to work out how to progress. Obviously, this is going to be very unique. But if there's one bit of advice you reckon most people aren't doing in their gym sessions that could really take them up a step, what would it be? There are a few things that I'd love to say. But let's keep it this simple so people have something to take away and use. Choose an exercise and get really, really technically good at it. Once you are really good at it, Stop, do three sets of 10. Once you get good, good at three sets of 10, do four sets of eight. When you get really good at four sets of eight, do five sets of six. And when you get really good at that, start back again and use a heavier load than the first time that you did it. And just rotate that. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite simple. Um, get good at a specific rep range with a certain load and then change it. And that's the thing. You know, Most people don't take the load. The exercise the same. You can keep mm -hmm. the exercise the same. That, that's a really good point as well. We can, we'll, we can go on to and virtual things, but people like to program up and create variety for the sake of variety. If you're getting yep. stronger, you're good. Well, Steve, thank you very much again. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and I'll see you obviously next week. And I'll obviously, I'll thank put, you, I'll put obviously our handles in the description below and also send me the article about eccentric stuff, the link to that. And I'll also put that. I'll go do. Uh, I'll so do, people read it. Thank you. Cheers, Steve. Cheers. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching the podcast. If you're like me and like to binge watch podcast episodes, click here for our most recent episode. And if you enjoy the show and want to be updated when new videos come live, click here to subscribe to the channel.